Do you know anything about a grave site being here? Well, the dog actually alerted to it right there when it's oh. laid up against the tree. Right here, you see this? There's three big, looks bloodish. He's a bad person. In what way? Every way I can. I'm actually glad he's in jail. He's a dying jail. Because all the he's done. Why didn't he want you to leave with uh, your dad? Because he's a when 56-year-old James Jim T. Whitaker suddenly vanished, police believed their biggest concern would be unraveling the truth of what happened to him. But as they dove deeper into the investigation, they soon uncovered that this was just the beginning of a twisted case. Jim's disappearance would prove to be the catalyst in exposing a sickening secret that had been kept hidden for years. Let me see that. That's something. Oh, who appears to be a skull cap? Huh? Yep. It all began on the afternoon of July 25, 2020, when sheriff's deputies in Hawking County, Ohio, responded to reports of gunshots in a residential neighborhood. How we doing? All right. We shot a gun. I'm 40. That's on the road. Well, she said you got a horse shooting. I shot a horse shooting at 22. The deputies were greeted by 18-year-old Melody Dixon and her father, 40-year-old Michael, or Mike as he was most often known. While Mike had been staying at his friend James Jim Whitaker's property for about two years, Melody had moved in about four months ago. While nothing may have seemed amiss with the father and daughter initially, police would likely look back at this interaction with concern later. What'd you shoot in it? What kind of ammo? Um, I'll hold on okay, that'd be terrific. There was something far more alarming going on at this house than disruptive shooting. However, with the residents being so cooperative, the deputies had no reason to think that anything was amiss. They would soon realize just how wrong they were. Was you shooting anything else? That and the 22. Okay. We had a, I only shot that once, and I can show you where it hit the tree. Okay. Because I know they go far. It's like shooting a rifle, right. well, the new ones. Well, it's no big deal. We had somebody that fired a gun, and it hit a, it struck a windshield. Nobody got hurt or anything like that. The father and daughter were let off with a warning, and the deputies departed. Just a few short hours later, though, another deputy would be back at the same property under vastly different circumstances. Jim's family had called the police to report him missing. This is my dad's property, Jim Whitaker. Okay. We haven't been able to communicate with him for 20-some days. He's not in his house. I think something's happened to him. There's other people in here when we got here. They left about as soon as we got here. They didn't give us no answers on where he was. The thing is, I know my son. He doesn't, he's never done this. 56 okay. six years old, he's never just disappeared. Right. Jim's mother said she'd last talked to him at the beginning of the month, around the 4th of July. They frequently spoke and had made plans to check in with each other the next day. But Jim never answered the phone again. While it was clear Jim was missing, police were likely alarmed to see that Mike and Melody had also vanished. The nature of their relationship, along with the reason they decided to suddenly depart, raised more than a few questions. Jim's family had actually seen Mike acting suspiciously earlier, just after the deputies who responded to the reports of gunshots left. He had a 50-pound bag of dog food in one hand, a dog, a live dog, a chainsaw, and reached over and grabbed five arrows off of that thing that's out there and a pair of gloves. Those were not the only items missing from the house. Some of Jim's things were missing too, including a firearm, a crossbow, and two TVs. It's, it's possible that he just took his personal possessions right here. It's this area very unlikely. Like, oh, he has struggled to I keep this house I understand. I'm just for saying years. it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Okay, okay. But he would have done that when my mom died, not now, just all of a sudden. Okay. Still trying to figure out exactly when Jim went missing, police also spoke with his friend Keith. While he provided interesting information, the story got even more bizarre. Keith claimed that Mike had showed him a strange note, allegedly written by Jim back on July 12th. 13 days earlier. Mike came out. We were fiddling with something in the garage. Mike was fixing something, and I was sitting there. He fiddling with it. He came in the house, and then he come back out, and he's like, I just found this in Melody's stuff. And it okay. sounded like a, 
like a an profession odd, of an love odd profession slash love no. to Mike's and his daughter, that girl Melody yeah. slash notes. Yeah, but okay. you know, um, very weird. It, he it was signed Jimbo. I didn't think Jimmy ever signed his name Jimbo. Uh -huh. You know. Additionally, the handwriting didn't appear to match Jim's penmanship, and his mother and daughter both said the way it was written didn't sound like Jim at all. While they didn't know it just yet, this note would end up being a huge clue helping to explain what exactly had happened to Jim. As well, the timing of the note meant that Jim could have been missing for weeks at this point. It was clear that something wasn't right. Unfortunately, the most likely sources of answers were Mike and his daughter Melody and they were nowhere to be found. The next day, several deputies and detectives from the sheriff's office returned with a warrant to Jim's property to conduct another search. What they uncovered made their hunt for Mike and Melody even more urgent. What's in the basement? That's where Michael was staying at. a bunch of crap. I would definitely wear gloves. Wear what? I'd definitely wear gloves. It's dirty. Who uh, kicked in the door? I'm just trying to determine what was like it and what was new, that type of thing. But that, that door has never been locked. Never, ever. So Mike, that's just, Mike can put that on there. Do you know why? No, I have no idea why. But. When the officers entered the basement and saw the conditions, they quickly realized that this would not be an easy search. One thing, however, likely stood out to them right away. Mike and Melody were both supposedly living here, but there was only one bed. While this was clearly concerning, it was only the tip of the disturbing iceberg when it came to Mike and Melody. It smells like feet. I think my smell quit. What? So I think I quit smelling a while ago. No blondies. The camo bag? No, it's blood. Um, I saw the camo bag I flipped. You did have light like blood. Right there. See the glove? I was looking at that bag right there. Right here, you see this? There's three big, looks bloodish. There's four, actually. Mm -hmm. Faced with the inhospitable state of the basement, the officers went back upstairs to regroup. Eventually, they decided to call out a canine search unit to go over the entire property, inside and out. All right, let's collect that stuff from the basement real quick. Let's send her downstairs. Station one. You're going home and taking a bath? Yes. <laughs> the dog didn't alert upstairs or downstairs in the house, not even for the presumed drops of blood on the camouflage print bag found in the basement. A second dog was brought in to double-check and delivered the same result. While this may have seemed promising when considering Jim's fate, it wouldn't for long. The investigators swabbed the item and took it as evidence, just in case, before expanding the search to the great outdoors. Nothing? How close does he have to be, depending on... Uh, usually within about four to six feet, oh. he'll alert. Okay. While following the dog, one of the detectives came across what appeared to be a tombstone. Here, the canine alerted, which it was trained to do only if it detected the smell of human remains. Before they could start digging, Jim's daughter returned to the scene. What she said dashed any hope of finding clues near the headstone. Do you know anything about a gravesite being here? Not, not your dad's, but a... No. There's a World War One. Oh, no, 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 that's just a, okay, so here's what happened. That, that got, me and my mom actually got that from, that's part of her family, and they replaced the stone, and they allowed us to take that one. There's no, there's no grave to it. Oh. It's just a stone. Uh, yep, it's just okay. a stone. Well, the dog actually alerted to it right there, when it's no. laid up against the tree. They theorized that the headstone had absorbed some of the scent of human remains from the cemetery where it came from, resulting in a false alert. While it was good news that they hadn't found a body, it was also troubling, because they still had no leads about what happened to Jim. Only later would they realize they had overlooked a crucial source of evidence. Still, a promising lead turned up. On a property just a few miles down the road, the investigator stopped by to chat with a man named Kenny, who knew both Mike and Jim. Sheriff's Office, how are you? Look for Mike. Huh? Michael Dixon. What about him? 
Looking for him. He ain't seen him for a couple days. Sure about that? Positive. All right, well, because his car's right there. I know it is. Yeah. So let's not do something silly if you're not telling the truth. Oh, I'm telling the truth. Okay, so when did, when did he drop his car off? I guess last night, but I wasn't here. My girlfriend was here then. Okay, can I get a look at it? Oh, I don't care. All right. Apparently, Mike left his car behind because it was leaking transmission fluid. However, that was the only explanation he offered before taking off again. When looking through the back window, the deputies could see the chainsaw Jim's daughter said Mike took from the house. Mike's mom and stepdad, Denise and Frank Specie, lived just down the street from where Mike had left his car. When they headed over to the Specie house, the investigators found not only what they were looking for, but also would soon discover that multiple members of the Dixon family were hiding things, even if some of them didn't know it. Mike? Mike? Um, yeah, he's got a warrant. Yeah. 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 Anybody else here or just your dad? My dad and my daughter. Okay. The detectives placed Mike under arrest on a pre-existing traffic warrant, but that wasn't what they really wanted to talk to him about. They made him aware of his Miranda rights before getting to the heart of the matter. You want to talk to me about what's been going on at uh, Jim's house? They say that he, I don't his daughter come down a few days ago and said that I had to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. He's been gone, I think, since the 5th. And his sure. daughter comes and saying, oh, I was getting rid of his stuff. I didn't get rid of nothing. His, he was like a dad to me. So what do you think has happened to Joe? I'm hoping nothing. I'm hoping he just took off, but I don't know why. Further up the driveway, other detectives spoke with 18-year-old Melody. Did uh, James say where he was going or anything? No. No, he didn't really say where he was going. He was just. What happened to uh, some of his stuff? What do you mean? Like his guns, his TV set, and all that. Well, the gun was been missing, and I don't know about the TV. Unfortunately for Melody, Kenny and his son Jeff, who owned the property where Mike left his car, told the detectives otherwise. Mike Dixon. Did he sell you a TV, a trace, a TV? Um, yeah. The other missing TV was purchased by Kenny. This was just the tip of the iceberg when it came to Melody's secrets, and they only became more troubling from here. The investigators continued to press her, hopeful that she would slip up again. You think that something's happened to uh, Jim? I think he just took off because that's what he's been talking about for a while. Where would he go? Well, he told me and Dad, he's like, I'm just going to not be here all day. And you guys can keep this place because my family don't get a goddamn about me or whatever. So. You think something's happened to him? I don't really know that the last time I've seen him was or fifth. Melody was talking to police on the 27th, meaning that Jim had been missing for around 23 days at this point. Melody said that prior to living with Jim and her father, Mike, she'd been in foster care and was specifically not supposed to be in contact with her father. The reason for this was stomach churning, as investigators would find out. But for now, police focused on what they knew and the note Jim supposedly left. Did you and Jim have a relationship? No. He wanted one. He wanted one? And then when I told him no, he like went berserk and that's what that letter was about. This topic would come up again later. Currently, the detectives probably noticed that despite the dire situation, Melody's priority was clearly not the missing Jim, but her father, Mike. Is he going to jail? Mm-hmm. Mike? Because there's a warrant for him. 
Mike was transported to the sheriff's office, where the detectives continued to question him about Jim's whereabouts. But Jim had talked about in the past. Mm -hmm. Was there anything to indicate that he was going to that his depression had reached a limit on that day? I didn't think so. I didn't think so. But I mean, if he was going to basically... Why would he take a TV? Yeah. While they'd already found the TVs Mike sold to Kenny and Jeff, investigators also tracked down more of Jim's missing property. A firearm matching the description of Jim's favorite rifle was sold on July 6th to an acquaintance of Mike's named Tommy, but he resold it two days later. Investigators were able to track it down and collected it as evidence. When chatting with the detectives, Tommy revealed more than just the location of the rifle. He also shared some concerning information about Jim and Mike's odd relationship. Because, see, Mike will be shit out of that old man a bunch. Like, oh, really? yeah, they got to fight a lot, man. The old man would get high on meth. The old man was a meth head. And he'd get high on meth and stuff, and him and Michael would get into it, hot and heavy. I mean, he blacked Michael's eyes, and Michael blacked his eyes, too. I mean, it was just like they was two fighting married couple. I swear to God, that's what you thought. The next day, when the deputies returned to ask Tommy a few follow-up questions, he had something else to add, this time sharing what Mike had apparently told him about his daughter, Melody, and Jim. Um, he had said that he had caught, caught a, his daughter and him in bed. I asked him. That's on my mom, my kids, I asked him right in, that, uh, right in my living room two days before you guys arrested him. I asked him if he did it. And here's his exact reaction when I asked him. He's like, no, nah, man, I didn't do it like that. Like, what are you Like, how you put that? You know when somebody's being sarcastic? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, like you can see in their voice and hear that, you know, see, he knows more than what he was saying. Everything Tommy shared was concerning. And investigators' suspicions only increased when they spoke to some of Jim's neighbors. He, he mentioned that he was going to kill Jimmy I don't know how many times. Yeah, several times. Before. And this was even before Melody showed up down here. Yeah. But they get in fights and they throw shit at each other. They get in fights and the next thing you hear was a couple gunshots and you have to wonder, okay, did somebody shot, shoot somebody this time really for real? At the sheriff's office, the investigators shared similar concerns with Mike. I guess what makes it look strange for you, Mike, is that you guys continued to live there and never let anybody know that Jim was missing. I mean, why not call the sheriff's office and say, hey, this guy's left, the TV's missing, his gun's missing, and I haven't seen him for a few days. Even though I understand Jim's an adult, but why didn't you go and call us? I don't know, I should have when I was going to. I asked a few people what they thought, and they said, oh no, Jim might be doing something he don't want the cops to know about. I should have called Jim. And then, Mike made a mistake. Nah, I cared about Jim a lot, I did. But I mean, I'm not funny, but he was like my uncle. Mm -hmm. Alarmingly, Mike used the past tense when referring to Jim. It only got worse from there. Mike soon confessed to something so horrendous that not only was he placed under arrest, but detectives returned to the Specie residence to bring Melody in for an interview of her own. How are you? Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Melody, I'd like to uh, go down, I'd like to take you down to Laurelville and talk with you about your dad. Okay? You okay to go? You're not under arrest. You're not under arrest or anything like that. We want to go down and just have a conversation with you in a nice private area. Melody agreed to go back to the station. Once they got there, the detectives made her aware of her Miranda rights before finally getting down to business. And what I would like for you to do is talk with us about the incident that occurred with Mr. Whitaker, about what your dad has told us. Are you willing to talk to us? Do you actually have a recording of him saying that? Sure do. Could you check my video? Recording first and then getting to it. I don't have the video with me. So I basically have to go out on one right now. Well, I don't know if what you're telling me is correct or not. Wouldn't you want the family to have closure? You think that James deserves the to be laying out? Not good people, in my opinion. So Pardon? They're not good people, so I would want them. They're not good people. I don't know. I don't know why. So you don't care about James? No, no, I don't say. Well, he's a bad person. In what way? 
every way I'm looking. In every way, in I mean, what way would that be? Why do you say James is a bad person? Why didn't he want you to leave with uh, your dad? The investigators would return to the quandary of why Jim didn't want Melody to leave, and this discussion would reveal what could be the key to understanding this nightmare situation. So you guys were arguing. I, yeah, I, I need that. I need that here. Okay. So he has hold of your wrist. Yeah, I don't want to just sit with my hand and just get me over. And I wasn't thinking, I just went to the back. And then he went out for You grabbed you by your throat? Yeah, I just made it look different, so. This wasn't the full story. Melody was leaving out some of the most chilling pieces, but for now, detectives had no choice but to turn to Mike, who told them a similar story, resulting in his arrest. Not only that, but he also agreed to go back to the property and reconstruct the crime scene for police. I told him I was going down the stairs to get my gun, and I went and got my gun. Come up? Yep. You That's heard. when Melody was coming out of the thing. I could hear them scruffling a little bit. What were they? Were they saying anything to each other? No, I just heard her kind of like yelling. And supposedly, she grabbed like his gun. She said, "Oh, she remembers just looking down the barrel of it." I heard the safety on his gun click off, and that's when I shot mine. So Jean saw that your dad was pointing a gun at him. Mm -hmm. Not much reaction to him. He didn't have enough reaction time to do anything? Is that what you're saying? It's like, not close, not really A couple feet away. Um, I wasn't close enough that I was looking for the whole other way. I'm right here where I'm standing. Okay. And if he would be to come forward towards me a little bit, now that way just so right there. And if you would have turned like, if you would have been going to look like, yep, right like that. Right there. Right there? Yep, now right just like that, exactly. And where did you hit him in his body? Right on, right there where he's pointing towards his eye. The investigators had now confirmed that Jim was deceased, but the location of his body remained a mystery. The issue of motive would also come into question when police found evidence suggesting that there was something sickening going on behind closed doors. He only did what he did because of me. This, as it was later revealed, was probably true, but perhaps not for the reasons Melody was giving. He wasn't doing it because he's a person or whatever. I understand. He's just trying to protect you. And I don't think he should get get like maximum punishment or whatever, like everyone else is, you know, it's basically, it was my fault when it started. No, it's not your fault. I wouldn't say that. Because if I would have never wanted to go set to you, that was my fault. No matter the truth, the gory efforts that followed Jim's death meant that the Dixons were in a heap of trouble. Did he talk about how they cleaned it up? Just a bleach. Bleach, do you know where he bought the bleach from? Was there bleach at the house? Yes. Yeah. Did you cover up anything over here? Did you clean anything? Yeah, I cleaned. Uh, did you clean up on the wall? A little bit, and then there was flatter up. You can kind of like right in that way, you can see stuff. Where was most of the blood? On, on the, the floor. It was most on the floor. Yep. Was there, was there a puddle? In the process of the cover-up, Mike had also rearranged some of the furniture. Surprisingly, he hadn't done so alone. You know, a reason I didn't think much about it is because me and Jimmy were talking about it. 
Mike may have even been in the room before Jimmy had not been around. Not been around. You know, yeah. Well, we just actually rearranged stuff around and, um, you know, maybe threw away trash or stuff like that. Nothing was cleaned. Makes me feel crappy or sick to think if Jimmy was around in any way, shape, or form, you know, dead even or whatnot when I was up there. While Jim's friend Keith was nothing more than an unwitting accomplice, others were far more involved in the case than they led on. Back with Mike, the officers moved the refrigerator into its original position so Mike could continue his reconstruction of the scene. Is where were where was the gun? The gun was about where my feet are. Which which way was the gun? Pointing the barrel towards that. Say, Use that. This was it. Say this is the barrel like that. It was about right there. Was it laying on him? Right there. So where's the butt of the gun? Right there. That's the butt of the gun. Not just when I come up here, not just when I come that way. Kicked it out, and then what? No, I reached down when I told him to see if he had any calls. Okay. And then what'd you do? Where was Melody? Over there. Probably she, about where that baseball bat sat. Once again, Melody filled in more of the missing details. What kind of clothes did you have on at the time? My graduation dress. Graduation dress. What color? White. What did you do with it? Pretty sure my dad burned it. He just had stuff on it. While Melody believed her father burnt the dress, he never admitted to it. When the dress was burned, however, was an entirely different matter. Jim's neighbors provided a little more insight. We were sitting here just enjoying our 4th of July, and Melody comes walking down the driveway, and she stood there and asked if we had any gas that she could buy from a gas can. Mm -hmm. And what she was wearing that day, we all noticed that it looked like it had a blood stain on the middle of it. About that big around. When examining Jim's financial records, the investigators noticed that his debit card was used at a gas station on the 4th of July. This very well could have been the last place Jim had gone, but they also probably had to wonder if this transaction was made by Melody or Mike using his card. Unfortunately, they never found out, as the gas station footage had already been recorded over. But something else Melody said in interrogation clued the investigators in on who else may have known about the crime, and lied about it as well. Is, is your family, like Frank, or is he married? Are they supporting you? I mean, are they being nice to you, at least? Me and my grandpa. Your grandpa? Frank. Frank? Okay, that's your grandpa. Okay. Have you tried to talk to him about it so that they understand what what you're going through? I mean, yeah, I'm going to talk to my grandpa. But the other ones, you can't really, can't really trust him. Mike also revealed that he told his stepdad, Frank, about killing Jim. This was about to be a big problem for Frank as the police headed back to the Specie house a third time. With that being told, I want you to understand something. I've already talked to Mike. I've already talked to Melody. They both indicated to me that they talked to you and told you of the involvement of uh, James' death, or Jimmy, if you, that's what you want to call him. When did he tell you this, and how did he tell you this? Was it right after it occurred, or a day or two afterwards? So when exactly. they come in, when they come here, that's a, I thought he shot at him. I didn't know. You just said he shot him. Shot at. Shot at. That's that's all I. That's the way it was phrased to me. Okay, and he didn't say, "I killed him." No. He didn't say, no. "I buried him." I get rid of the body. No. Anything like that. No. Because that's when I would have gotten a hold of somebody and found out what was going on. Because I knew Jimmy years ago. Did he try to bring a weapon here? No. Any kind of gun at all, handgun, not long that, gun. Not that I, not have, not that I've seen. Frank was granted a reprieve for now, but when police eventually got to the truth, Frank would be facing some serious consequences. Still, it didn't take long for those consequences to begin. 
something else Melody shared had the potential to land the family back in hot water. What happened to Mike's guy? I don't know these, these, this information because... Did he give it to Frank? Mm. Yeah. Melody was right. Mike didn't give the firearm to Frank. He gave it to someone else in the family. This meant it was time for a fourth visit to the Specie house. No, I didn't do my job. Yes. What's your name, ma'am? I'm Tanisha. You're Tanisha? No, Denise. Denise. Yes. Oh, I was say, Tanisha is an odd name. <laughs> Different name. Uh, who, what was in the house, Denise? My husband. That's My right. son. Is that John. 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 John, he's in the shower. Okay. Um, can you have Frank come out as well? And I want to talk to you two just for a second. And then get you a prize of what we're doing here. By this point, Frank likely knew what was coming. How about yes. this? Yeah. Here's, what, here's what's happening right now. We are here for a search warrant of your residence. Okay. Officers make everyone come outside so they can speak with them. Mike's mother, Denise, was visibly distraught. I just found out about this yesterday. I had a phone call. Well, we've got a lot of explaining to do to you and all that stuff. But like I said, there's a process we have to follow. All right. She only became more upset when one of the officers tried to read her Miranda rights. Okay. I have been through anything, I guess. Okay. Listen, oh, this, is not them, this isn't you, though, you know. Okay. okay. Meanwhile, once Mike's brother John was out of the shower, the deputies took him aside and advised him of his Miranda rights, even though he wasn't under arrest. Essentially, there's only one question that I really need to ask you. Gun. Correct. Where is that gun at? Get it out of my trunk. It's in your trunk? Yes, sir. You know, the question is, is Michael brought you the gun. He, I, I bought the gun from my brother before this, any, any of this ever happened. Um, he kept asking me to borrow it. He wanted to go hunting with it. And then he showed back up with it that morning. Um, I didn't know yet. He just showed up with it. Here's your gun back. The suspected murder weapon was exactly where John said it was. John had something else to share besides the location of the weapon. Uh, this, this has been brewing. Jimmy and Michael have been threatening to shoot each other for two years. I mean. The reason why things had escalated now, rather than any other time, was nothing short of scandalous. Did Michael tell you that he shot and killed Jimmy? No, no he did not personally tell me. He, did not. he didn't personally tell you, but did anybody in secondhand tell you? I am willing to plead the fifth on that. John chose to plead the fifth. He did not get in any legal trouble. In addition to sorting out who knew what about the crime, police still needed to locate Jim's body and try to work out the true motive for his death. Both tasks would be far trickier than anyone bargained for. What happened then with James' body? I was in part of that. I didn't mean to go downstairs and go to bed. So he, he told you to go downstairs? Well, he and, and walked me up downstairs and because I was like shocked. My niece kept screaming around me, but I just wanted to move. And that's when he grabbed me and brought okay. me downstairs and like helped me in bed and told me to like, stay out here for a little while. And, and I fell asleep. Mike provided firsthand horrific details of what happened next. He was right here. I took him and I slid his head over this way. I put the sled right here beside him, took him, rolled him over, took him, got a hold of the sled, put it here, and rolled him over onto it, and rolled him out the door. The sled Mike used was a deer sled, frequently used by hunters to haul heavy game home. The story only got grislier from there. So when you woke up, was the house, was all the, the blood and everything cleaned up? It was already gone? So you didn't know where any of that stuff went to? He said he burned it. Did you ask him or did he just tell you? Well, he told me not for 
I'm just going to go take care of the thing. But you never actually witnessed how the body was dragged out of the the home, how it was removed or anything no, like that. No, because he didn't want me to know. He didn't want, me to he didn't want you to watch. He, he knew once he pulled the trigger that he did that. While Melody and Mike both insisted that she didn't help clean up the crime scene, police likely found it hard to believe that Mike could have pulled off the entire cover-up without help. Melody was also in trouble for lying to the police when they first asked her if she knew what happened to Jim. As a result, she was placed under arrest for obstruction of justice. While Mike was doing his walkthrough and reconstruction of the crime, Melody was also brought over from the jail to do her own on-site interview. While there, she saw her father for the first time since his arrest. Yes. Melody was also asked to reconstruct the crime. You went to bed. I just went to bed at that, mom at that moment. You just went to bed with bloody arms and... Well, I was kind of hunting with the bed in a very long time, in days, and when I came down here, I just basically passed out. However, this wasn't the only thing they wanted to ask her about, as police were still trying to piece together the real motive. Had there been anything going on between you and Jimmy? No. No. I, need, I, need, I mean, I need to know. Nothing. No, he wanted something, but I told him no, and he got mad about it, and I told him... When was that? Oh, wait, basically the entire time I've been here. So the entire time... He was like... He had been hitting on, hitting on you, wanting you to do things with him. Yeah. And you never did? Mm-hmm. What yeah. about anything between you and your dad? Nothing at all? No. As odd as this line of questioning may sound, there was a very good reason investigators were asking. There was something unsettling going on with Mike and his 18-year-old daughter, Melody. Police were made aware of the troubling allegations early on in the investigation when speaking with Jim's family. Michael Dixon was here. Yeah. Yeah. And what's his girlfriend's name? It's, it's his daughter. daughter. Oh, his daughter. Melody. Melody. Yeah, it's his daughter slash girlfriend. Police had also spoken to Melody's mother, Brandy, and what she shared added an upsetting layer to the case. Brandy explained the reason that Melody had been put in foster care and was not supposed to be in contact with her father. Uh, the children's were decided not let Melody go back out because they think there was a possibility he made out with his own daughter, so they kept her in foster care. When she came up here and started visiting me, she wanted to see her dad, but nobody could stop her because she was 18. She started seeing her dad, but I don't know the things he said to her or whatever, but he got her back on drugs again, like meth and all that crap. Brandy said that there were multiple previous CPS reports detailing an ongoing struggle to keep Mike and Melody apart, but this is unconfirmed. Brandy also alleged that Mike's mother, Denise, was not only aware of the incestuous relationship, but had purchased lingerie for Melody. However, we do not have evidence to confirm this claim. Melody's younger sister made even more revolting claims. Whenever we lived out with uh, his mom and dad, I walked in the trailer and Melody and him was under the blanket, but maybe. But you said that that happened out at uh, Frank and Denise's house? Was that yeah. like a long time ago? Or like... No, it wasn't. It hasn't even been a year yet. This September 20th. Okay. They would always hold hands. And all this, and he, oh, he tried to hold my hand. He was like, "Come on, baby girl, you can hold my hand." I said, "Uh, no. Do you want me to be the out of you? That's just nasty. I'm not like three, two years old. I'm not your dad. He's in jail. He's a dying jail with all the that he's done." Horrifically, Brandy and Melody's sister would not be the only ones to share troubling information with the police. Keith, the Whitaker family friend who had unknowingly helped Mike rearrange the crime scene, told the police that he had tried to convince Jim to kick Mike and Melody out, as he suspected they were having an incestuous affair. He told police that on multiple occasions while he was over, Mike and Melody would go downstairs together 
and he would hear sounds of intimacy shortly thereafter. On one occasion, he said Melody invited him to stick around so they could have some fun, which sent Mike into such a rage that he grabbed a weapon and shot it out the back door several times. With the possibility of an illicit father-daughter relationship now in the mix, the investigators had to wonder if this could have been a factor in Jim's death. Little did they know, the case would get even more twisted. While investigators had Melody and Mike at the crime scene, they focused on trying to locate Jim's remains. During his reconstruction of the crime, Mike walked the investigators through the chilling steps he took to get rid of the evidence. So, you drug... Which way did you drag him down into here? You drug him right through here? And then show me where you laid the body. His head was about right there. And the feet were down that way. And his head is about where your, head, your feet are? Okay. And over, and you say you burnt him 10 to 15 hours? Yes. And you were, the whole time you were using wood, sticks, wood sticks. accelerant? Clothes. Really not the only time I used any accelerants when I first started it. Mike also said that he burned Jim's cell phone, multiple shotgun shells, and other spent casings. Mike, how much stuff was piled on top of him, on top of the body? I have a foot or two. A what? Foot or two. Foot or two. So you got a foot or two on top of him. You light him. You throw tires on after it's gone. And wood. And you just kept throwing that stuff on there? For a little bit. Not all in all that long. Then Did I... Once I got it going, I went now. Okay. Did you did you stir it around? Like I mean, fluff him up. Let's say like you'd fluff a fire up. Once. You did. Did you see his body then when you fluffed it? Mm -hmm. okay. Did you come out and make sure that he was gone? Mm -hmm. You didn't look at it to see if there's anything left. No. The investigators were inclined to believe Mike, as they'd already found a way to substantiate his claims. See, that's something. Oh, who cares to be a skull cap? Hmm? Yep. Is that hair right there? Because it wore that rope take it up. That looks more like hair. Is that bad hair? Yep. yep. Looks like it. Clancy. There's some more. The initial investigators and the K-9 units had passed over this very burn pit without alerting. Along with the bone shards, the investigators also found a bone with what looked to be medically implanted scaffolding. Jim's doctor confirmed that the device could be consistent with the spine surgery Jim had years ago. But it still wasn't over. According to Mike, there was another place that needed to be searched for the rest of Jim's remains. Just a few days after Mike and Melody were arrested, the sheriff's department decided to pay Mike's stepfather, Frank, another visit. All right, so this is what's happening. I have a warrant for your arrest. What? Okay, for obstruction of justice, okay, during the investigation, okay? What? All right, so I'm going to place you under arrest right now, okay? I need you to turn around, put your hands behind your back. Frank was cooperative, but Denise wasn't shy about expressing her displeasure. Yeah. Sucks. While Frank was in jail, the lead detectives, along with the prosecutor, once again tried to convince him to share what he knew about the case. What he revealed was appalling. There's conversations that I know you had with Michael, with Melody present, especially when it came to destroying the teeth. Frank insisted he didn't know anything until they showed him a video clip of him mentioning this to an officer at which point he magically remembered. Why did he tell you that he destroyed the truth? How did that come out? He just come out and said it, because he goes, uh, he seemed like he really got into it. He just seemed like he, it was weird, because he seemed like he enjoyed it. 
And I'm like, you enjoyed something like that? I need to understand how he got from Jimmy's gone to describing in detail to the point where you think he enjoys destroying human teeth because that's a big jump and you're giving me no detail here did he say whether or not jimmy was dead when he knocked the teeth out yeah he said he was gone that's did what he kept saying he was gone he didn't say nothing about him being dead he's gone after learning this, the detectives brought Mike back out for another walkthrough and enlisted his help to find what might remain of the teeth and the jawbone he said was kept with it. What was it in again? A bowl. A bowl. A bowl is plastic. Hold on. Like this? You put it underneath this shelf or underneath here? Underneath right there. Could it be anywhere else? How big's a bowl? Oh, it's bigger on this that metal right there. How high is it? About three, four inches. That was in that. It was in that? Mm-hmm. Where could it have gone? I think most of you guys have done moves. I just thought we'd have found it by now. I mean, the one hit did, just sitting there. Detectives were left with no choice but to out the entire basement, one item at a time. Despite all this work, Jim's jawbone and his teeth could not be found. An examination of the remains that were located revealed the sickening reason Mike had taken the chainsaw with him when he first fled Jim's residence. Many of the bone fragments showed evidence of cut marks, suggesting that Mike dismembered Jim's body before burning it. However, it was impossible to determine a precise cause of death because the remains were so damaged. Even after making this horrible discovery, the most shocking revelation was yet to come. Several months later, while waiting for the case to go to court, one of Melody's cellmates asked to speak with the detectives. What she alleged aligned with what many had feared all along. Well, her and her dad had a relationship of sleeping with each other. How do you know that? She said it. How did she say it? Her and her dad had you know, bedroom together and... Told her I was like, you know that's not yeah. right. And she just like acted like it was no big deal. So, I mean, every day, we would tell her and ask her, like, why are you, like, she's in love with her dad. Did you have a relationship with James Whitaker? No. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Did you ever kiss? No. Not even Contrary to this, another woman incarcerated with Melody claimed she'd heard the exact opposite about Melody and Jim. Did she ever talk about any kind of relationship with him? Yeah. Yes? Yes. What, what did she say about that? I mean, pretty much that she would sleep with them for money. If Melody did have a relationship with Jim as well as her father, it had the potential to change almost everything about the case. It would explain the regular fights between Jim and Mike and could mean that the shooting was the fallout of a twisted love triangle. While looking for proof of a relationship between Melody and Jim, the detectives obtained a search warrant to go through Melody's phone. There's a video on your phone. You know, police officers retrieved your phone. Um, looks like there's contact between you and your father. Will that be accurate or not? How long have you had a relationship with Michael? The first thing that happened was when I got taken out of mom's custody and put in grandma's custody back in 2017. Melody claimed to be on meth each time she had relations with her father. How many times did that happen? The, the meth using or? Yeah. Uh, the uh, with uh, Michael. And I went out 16, like, between four and six times. 
Disturbingly, this had taken place at the Specie House, while Melody and Mike were living with Frank and Denise, Melody's grandparents. As Melody's confession continued, it only became more upsetting. And um, how many times after that did it happen when you weren't at your grandmother's? Like, did that start to happen when you start to live with him and James? Yeah. About how many times? I don't know more than I can count. For like years of my life, um, whenever you try to say no, and then like men are on top of you and you can't push them off, and then whenever I would tell my dad no, he would stop and he would respect that. So I feel like, so that's why I thought it was that's why I thought it was okay because he would always stop. I said no. You realize it wasn't okay. You done that now. You also realize it wasn't your fault. Because it wasn't, okay? It was not okay. It wasn't your fault. He's a grown ass man and should know better. In 2021, Michael Dixon was sentenced to life in prison for murder, along with three years for tampering with evidence and 16 and a half years for engaging in corrupt acts. He will not be eligible for parole until 2070, at which point he would be 91 years old. Melody, meanwhile, was convicted on two counts of obstruction of justice and three counts of tampering with evidence. She was sentenced to nine years in prison and will be eligible for release in 2029. Finally, Frank was convicted on one count of obstructing justice. He received credit for time served and five years on probation. Despite these convictions, we still don't know the full truth about why Mike killed Jim or the exact date of Jim's death. These factors will remain a mystery until either Mike or Melody reveal these final secrets.